Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this second Sunday of Lent. One of the challenges I find that working with youth is that the lingo changes so much. Perhaps many people listening to this might remember the days when good things were considered groovy or hip, which then became rad or wicked. And now something that's good is lit or fire. Like, man, that's fire. You know, it can be hard to keep up with what the new lingo is. This past weekend, I was speaking with some teen girls who were telling me about their friendship drama. And so I said to them, oh, you know, do spell the, spill the tea, which means give more information. But one of the girls rolled her eyes and gave me a look and said, Father, come on. It's not 2018 again. Oh my goodness, come on, cut me some slack. But you know, one word that has kept its power over the years is the word awesome. A really good party is awesome. You can have awesome teachers and awesome movies and an awesome slice of pizza. It's really kind of just a throwaway word for anything that's really, really good. But think about what that word actually means. It means that we're full of awe, wonder, and amazement at this thing. It means that this thing is astonishing and breathtaking. Now, I've had some good pizza in my time, but I can't say I've ever had my breath taken away by a slice of pizza. But in today's gospel, we see something that is truly awesome, the transfigured glory of Jesus Christ. You know, for his entire time on earth, Jesus had hidden his glory behind his humanity. But now for one brief moment, the veil drops and he is seen for who he truly is. And the disciples' reaction is so telling. They fall on their faces. They're trembling and afraid. In the presence of the creator who sculpted the stars and the mighty mountains, the conqueror of death, the eternal one, the only proper response is awe. He is truly awesome. You know, as Catholics, our faith is often both and. It's both scripture and tradition, both faith and good works, both fasting and feasting. And here in the transfigured glory of Jesus Christ, we see another important both and. Jesus is both our closest friend and our majestic Lord. He is both the one who wants an intimate relationship with us and the one who obliges us to worship him as God. It's a both and. So as we pursue God, we have to recognize that a relationship relationship with him must be one of adoration as well as love. So let's get practical practical about three areas where we can show our awe and reverence before the mighty power of the Lord. A first area is in regards to his name. It says in scripture that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's incredible that the name of Jesus has such power to bring entire nations to their knees. At the name of Jesus, demons flee. And so a name isn't just a word, it's an entire identity and everything that goes with it. I mean, think about the various emotions and thoughts and memories that arise in your heart when you hear the word mom. So likewise, to use the name of God is to invoke him to praise him, to adore him, to bring him present. And so how can we be in awe of his name? Well, you know, there used to be an old tradition, which I think needs to make a comeback, where people would bow their heads in reverence at the names of Jesus and Mary. Also, of course, we have to make sure that we don't use his name in vain, irreverently. Some people struggle with that. You know, they struggle with saying, oh my, G-O-D, it becomes a real habit for some people. So if that's the case, the, probably the best way to stop it is to say immediately afterwards, immediately after saying, oh my, G-O-D, say out loud, blessed be his holy name. Not only will that make up for the harm of using his name in vain, it's also so embarrassing that we'll quickly abandon the habit. But what do we do if the people around us take God's name in vain? That was something I struggled with a lot in high school when all my friends would be taking God's name in vain and it just made me uncomfortable, but I didn't want to be that guy, you know, who tells everyone else to quit it. So I talked to a priest and he recommended using humor. He said, you know, next time someone says, oh my, G-O-D, say in response, oh, it's nice to hear you're finally praying. Or you can say, hey, don't talk about my best friend that way. You know, it makes people think and hopefully it makes them respect his name. A second way to be in awe of the Lord and really reverence him is to trust him when things don't go our way. Recently, I was praying fervently for someone's healing. And all of us who were praying were confident that God would grant it. But then they went to the doctor and received bad news. And so I must admit, it kind of shook my faith a little bit. And I questioned why God would allow that when everybody was asking in faith. But later that day, I opened my Bible. My eyes fell upon the words from the prophet Isaiah. When Isaiah said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. 
As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. You know, as a creature, we are not blessed with the perspective that God has. He sees all of human history in one glance. And so our role then is to trust him, especially when we don't understand what he's up to, because we have to be confident that our lives are in his providential, loving hands. I think a final and and particularly important way in which we show awe and reverence in the presence of Almighty God is in our relationship with the Eucharist. Much like the transfiguration, when ordinarily you don't see Jesus' glory, but then for this one instance we get a glimpse, ordinarily when we come to the Eucharist, we don't see the true body, blood, soul, and divinity that is truly present there. Not a sign, not a symbol, but actually substantially present. And really, the same reaction that the apostles had to the radiant glory of Christ should be our reaction when we approach his true presence. There was one time when St. Dominic Savio, who was that schoolboy saint who died at the age of 15 years old, he came to see a Eucharistic procession going through the town of Turin. And it had just rained and the streets were muddy, but the priest, but as the priest holding the Eucharist passed by, Dominic fell to his knees in the mud in adoration, heedless of any sort of discomfort there. Now, standing next to him was a devout businessman who was dressed in his finest suit, and he was respectfully praying, but he didn't want to get muddy. So when Dominic noticed this, he pulled out his handkerchief and laid it on the mud, indicating that the man should kneel on it. Well, the businessman was so struck by this boy's reverence that he quickly knelt in the mud, and he was ashamed that he was more concerned about his clothes than about the Eucharist. So what practical ways should we reverence the Eucharist? Well, there's an old custom that, again, should return, that whenever we pass a Catholic church, when we're driving, we make the sign of the cross and mentally greet the Eucharistic Lord who is there in the tabernacle. Certainly, we reverence him by the way we receive him. You know, if we're physically able, we, at our church, we encourage you to kneel to receive Holy Communion and to receive on the tongue if you're able. Certainly, also, the way we act and dress in church, it shows our reverence because we recognize that it's not just a social hall or a movie theater but rather we're at the very doors of heaven. That's not just a pious saying. It's an actual, though invisible, reality. Hence, let all mortal flesh be silent, as they say, dressed in our Sunday best and prepared to meet him. And of course, really most important in our reverence to the Eucharist is to make sure that our souls are clean for such a wondrous divine guest. You know, we've got to make sure that we have no mortal sin in our soul, mortal sins such as drunkenness, or intentionally missing Mass on Sunday, or sins of impurity. These must be cleansed before we receive the gift of gifts. If we do have the misfortune of having such a sin on our soul, we have to have our sin washed away in confession. And if we could see him in the Eucharist with our eyes, we would fall down and tremble at the majesty of the Eucharist. But we see him only with our faith, and thus we bring ourselves believing into his Eucharistic presence. My friends, at the end of our lives, we will see Jesus in his transfigured glory. On that day, we will do as Peter, James, and John did. We will fall on our faces in awe and wonder. If we have not reverenced him here on this earth, we will have reason to fear his mighty justice. But if we have loved and adored him on earth, then we have hope that he will stand before us as a merciful Savior and friend.